Imagine everything around you, the chair you're sitting on, the device you're watching this on, the very room you're in, is nothing but an elaborate illusion being fed into your brain. Sounds like a bad sci-fi movie, right? But it's a real philosophical nightmare scenario. What if you're just a brain in a vat, living in a simulated reality? If that idea makes your head spin, you're not alone. Philosophers, scientists, and sci-fi writers have been obsessing over this for centuries. Today, we're going to dig deep into the brain in a vat concept, from its dusty philosophical origins to cutting-edge neuroscience labs and from Descartes to the Matrix. Buckle up for a wild ride through reality, illusion, and everything in between. Let's jump into that hair hole, because I've already finished with rabbit ones. Let's say we have our brain on life support in a vat. How do we make it think it's still living a normal life? We need to feed it information, stimuli, and read its outputs, its responses. Essentially, we need an interface, a bridge between biology and electronics, between mind and machine. Welcome to the world of brain-computer interfaces, BCI. This field is already very real and advancing every year. We're not yet uploading minds to the matrix, but we're making remarkable progress in connecting brains with computers. One area BCIs have shined is in restoring function to people who are paralyzed or otherwise unable to communicate. For instance, a device called BrainGate, developed in the 2000s, has allowed paralyzed patients to control a computer cursor or robotic arm just by thinking. This sensor is connected to a pedestal that is attached to the skull and protrudes through the skin. They implant a tiny array of electrodes into the motor cortex, the part of the brain that controls movement. When the person thinks about moving their arm or hand, the neurons fire and the implant picks up those signals and sends them to a computer which translates them into cursor movements or robotic arm movements. It's crude and takes practice, but it works. In one famous case, a woman fed herself chocolate using a robotic arm she controlled with her mind. That is straight up science fiction made real. On the sensory side, we have things like cochlear implants, essentially early cyborg tech that's been around for decades. A cochlear implant takes sound from the environment and converts it into electrical signals sent straight to the auditory nerve, bypassing a damaged ear. The result? Deaf individuals can hear. It's limited, sound quality isn't great, and it doesn't restore normal hearing fully, but it shows the concept. We can feed digital information into the brain, and the brain interprets it as a perception. I was thinking about running to the store. What time will you be home? In about an hour. To not make me laugh. <laughs> Similarly, there are experimental retinal implants that can restore a bit of vision to blind people by electrically stimulating the retina or optic nerve with camera input. These produce crude patterns of light and dark, phosphons, in the person's vision. Again, it's not exactly the holodeck from Star Trek, but it's proof of concept that the brain can learn to make sense of artificial sensory data. Now ramp that up. Brain-computer interface researchers are working on more complex interfaces. Companies like Neuralink, founded by Elon Musk, talk about implanting thousands of tiny electrodes aiming for high bandwidth with communication with the brain. While a lot of that talk is speculative and yet to be proven, the direction is set. We want to both read from and write to the brain's sensory channels. If you can ever stimulate enough neurons in precisely the right way, you could create any sensory experience. It's a tall order. The brain has billions of neurons and trillions of connections, so replicating the full fidelity of natural experience is mind-bogglingly hard. But you might not need to get every detail for the brain to accept the illusion. Think about VR. Even with just sight and sound, imperfectly delivered through a headset and headphones, people can feel presence in a virtual world. With direct brain stimulation, you could in theory pipe in not just images and sounds, but touch, taste, smell, the works. We're not there yet, but experiments have given tantalizing hints. For example, neurosurgeons during certain brain surgeries, for epilepsy say, sometimes stimulate parts of a patient's brain while the patient is awake. The brain itself has no pain receptors. Patients have reported vivid experiences from these stimulations, seeing flashes of light, hearing imaginary sounds, feeling like they're falling, even recalling memories or emotions suddenly. The famous neuroscientist Wilder Penfield in the mid-20th century elicited all sorts of responses by zapping different cortical areas. In some cases, patients hallucinated complex scenes or sensations out of thin air. Penfield's work essentially showed that you can trigger the brain's own movies or sensations with a bit of electrical prodding. This is a primitive form of writing to the 
the brain. It's not subtle or controlled enough to simulate reality, but it validates the basic premise. The brain will perceive things that aren't really there if you feed the right signals. On the flip side, we have research where brain activity is read and interpreted. We already mentioned brain gate for motor output. Taking it further, scientists have used brain scans and machine learning to reconstruct images or videos a person is seeing or even imagining, with spooky albeit blurry accuracy. And in a simpler form, something like an EEG can tell if you're asleep, dreaming, alert, etc. just by reading your brain waves. So reading from the brain is doable to an extent, and writing to it is doable in simple ways. All this is to say, connecting a living brain to a computer to provide it an interface to the world is not science fiction anymore. It's a science project in progress. Now, a full brain in VAT setup where the brain thinks it has a body and is moving around in a rich world would require an incredibly advanced interface far beyond what we have. But the trajectory is there. We're essentially working on components of that right now under the labels of VR, neuroprosthetics, BCIs, etc. In fact, some experiments have basically put brains in robots. Cue the pinky and the brain theme. At the universe, University of Reading in 2008, scientists grew a network of about 300,000 rat neurons in a dish, effectively a simple brain on a microelectrode array, and connected it to a small robot. They dubbed this robot Gordon. The neurons received signals from the robot's sensors, like sonar for distance, and in turn their firing drove the wheels of the robot. Incredibly, this blob of brain cells in a vat of nutrients learned to make the robot move around and avoid obstacles. The neurons and machine formed a feedback loop. The robot provided sensory info, the neurons processed it and output an action, the robot responded, and so on. It's a primitive example of an embodied artificial brain, and it's literally a brain in a vat controlling a body, albeit a tiny rudimentary brain and a tiny wheeled robot body. Researchers observed that over time the neuron cluster adapted. It appeared to learn from its environment, adjusting the robot's behavior. Think about what that means. Those neurons had no body of their own, no eyes or ears, just electrode interfaces, yet they acted as a brain for a robot, as if the robot was its body. This hints that brain or brain tissue can potentially function and learn when given artificial inputs and outputs, not just the biological ones they evolved with. Another jaw-dropping case? In 2022, scientists managed to teach a collection of human and mouse neurons in a dish to play the video game Pong. Yes, you heard that right. Brain cells in a Patri dish playing Pong. How? Similar principle? They grew about 800,000 neurons on an array of electrodes and connected the setup to a computer running a simple Pong game. The neurons got feedback signals representing the game world, like whether the paddle missed the ball or not, and over time they actually learned to control the virtual paddle to hit the ball. They weren't told the rules. Through feedback, the neuronal network self-organized to perform the task. After a while, the dish-born mini-brain was playing Pong, not at championship level but definitely above chance. This system, nicknamed Dish Brain, gave researchers insight into how neurons learn and also served as a very, very rudimentary example of a thinking, acting entity that's a mix of biology and simulation. The neurons were essentially embodied in the Pong game game, that was their world. This experiment is like a tiny microcosm of the brain in a vat concept. The neurons experienced the Pong world through electrical signals and responded to it, presumably with no awareness that their reality was just a two-dimensional game. These examples show the technical and theoretical pieces coming together. We can keep a brain alive outside a body, we can feed information into brains and get information out, we can even let a brain or neural network interact with a virtual or robotic environment. It's not hard to imagine that as technology progresses, we could do this on the scale of a human brain. Brain. If one day, you could scan or transpose someone's entire brain signals to a machine and back, you might effectively upload them to a virtual world or grant a disembodied brain a virtual body. Scientists and futurists call this whole brain emulation or mind uploading. It remains speculative, but groups are working on the pieces. The Blue Brain Project and other neuroscientific efforts are trying to simulate brain circuitry. Basically, the, what we think must be happening is the neurons are growing as physically independent of each other as possible. They're just expressing themselves, uh, saying, I'm, I want this shape, this is my shape, and I'm going to grow like this. And then when they've all grown together, it's, they just take what they get when they bump into each other. The field of connectomics is mapping every connection in brains, so far only fully for tiny worm brains, but they're attempting mice, and ultimately humans, perhaps. If you have the complete map and a powerful enough computer, in theory you could simulate a person's brain. Then you wouldn't even need the biological brain. The simulation itself would be the brain in a vat, living in a digital environment. That's the ultimate endgame of this line of thought, a digital consciousness in a digital vat. Now, whether a simulated brain is truly the same as a conscious mind is a whole other debate. Philosophy of mind 
mind and AI consciousness another hair hole we could jump into, but at the very least, this concept has gone from crazy thought experiment to a guiding vision for some very real science and engineering. Even AI developments play a role here. For instance, to keep a brain in a vat happy, you'd need a very convincing interactive world, essentially an AI-driven simulation, like an ultra-advanced video game engine that can emulate reality or whatever world you want to give the brain. With today's AI, we see glimpses of how a computer could generate endless realistic scenarios. Imagine an AI that can generate a whole sensory world on the fly, some combination of advanced graphics, tactile feedback, etc., responsive to a person's choices. That's what you'd feed to the brain. We're inching towards that with VR games, AI narrative engines, etc. Let's not forget the flip side. Could an AI itself be a brain in a vat? If we create a true AI with human-like consciousness, will it feel like it's in whatever virtual environment we present it? Perhaps one day, an AI might ask us, hey, how do I know you are real and not just part of my training simulation? The tables might turn, but I digress. Before we get too far into sci-fi territory, let's ground ourselves. As of 2025, no human brain has been taken out of a body, kept alive, and made to experience a virtual world. We're not secretly brains in vats in some government lab, as far as we know. The closest things in real life are those medical experiments and brain-controlled robotics we mentioned, as well as the immersive, but still external, tech like VR headsets that trick our senses in more limited ways. However, we are all essentially brains in something. Each of us is a brain in a skull, in a dark, silent chamber, interpreting electrochemical signals. Your brain has never directly seen the world. It sits in darkness and infers the world from the signals it gets. In a way, we're already invaded, just with our skull and body as the vat and nature as the one feeding the signals. That's an idea that both neuroscientists and philosophers like to point out. Reality for us is always a reconstruction in the brain. The question is just whether the signals come from the external world or from some artificial source. So after this grand tour through vats and virtuality, where do we stand? Are we any closer to knowing if we're brains in jars? Not really. If it's a perfect deception, we can't definitively prove or disprove it. Thanks, Descartes. But we have learned a lot by asking the question. We've seen that this once purely hypothetical scenario is edging into the realm of scientific plausibility. We can sustain brains outside bodies for a bit. We can plug brains into machines to some extent. And we can simulate worlds imperfectly but improving. Each year, the line between science fiction and science fact gets a little blurrier, but perhaps more importantly, pondering the brain in a vat teaches us about ourselves. It reminds us how astonishing it is that our brains construct reality from signals, whether those signals come from eyes and ears or from electrodes and code. It also forces a kind of humility. We take for granted that what we see is what there is, but the brain in a vat laughs at our complacency. It's the ultimate memento mori for epistemology. Remember, your reality might be false, yet day to day we have to live our lives as if it's real. And maybe Maybe that's okay. Whether the world is base reality or a simulation, the experiences we have and the choices we make still matter to us. If you pinch me and I say, ouch, does it matter if a computer generated the pinch? My pain was real to me. Now that is post-irony. As one philosopher, Chalmers, suggested, being in a simulation doesn't negate the reality of our lived experiences. It just changes what we believe about the underlying nature of the world. In a post-ironic twist, we can even find some comfort in the brain in a vat idea. It highlights how crucial our connections are to our body, to others, to the environment. A brain alone in a jar is a sad thing. It's our interactions that make life meaningful, real or simulated. It also showcases human ingenuity and hubris. We are literally trying to play the role of that mad scientist, but hopefully for benevolent reasons. To cure disease, to extend life, to understand the mind. There's a chance that in the future, a human being could survive a terrible accident by living on as a brain in a support system, or that will create virtual heavens where minds can live free of physical pain. These possibilities raise huge ethical questions. Would that life be the same? Would it be right to do that? Who gets to decide the settings of someone's simulated paradise or nightmare? For now, we mostly encounter the brain in a jar as a metaphor or a thriller plot, but it's closer than ever to something tangible. As you finish this video, you can take solace in the likely reality that your brain is in your head, not a lab vat. The walls around you are probably not fake, knock on wood, or knock on simulated wood. Even if we can't be 100% sure philosophically, it's the best bet we have, and it's a useful bet because it lets us function. But keep a sliver of that doubt alive, not to be paranoid, but to stay curious. The moment we think we have it all figured out, along comes a new twist, or an evil demon, or a sneaky scientist, to shatter our assumptions. 
In the end, Brain in a Vat is more than a thought experiment. It's a story we tell ourselves about the ultimate uncertainty of knowledge and the wild potential of human and alien or AI technology. It's a modern myth that dances on the edge of science and philosophy, and like all good myths, it leaves us with a changed perspective. Next time you're daydreaming, or plugged into VR, or even just waking up from sleep, and you feel that slight disorientation, that tiny question, what is all this really? You'll be tapping into the same intrigue that spawned the brain in a vat. So, are you a brain in a vat? Probably not. But you'll never absolutely know. Sleep tight tonight with that thought. And if you happen to see a mad scientist sneaking around with a jar, maybe don't volunteer for any mind-blowing experiments.